So I wanted to say good evening and welcome to our virtual Whalen Library event. Tonight we are excited to have Professor Sarah Seeger here to talk about her forthcoming memoir, The Smallest Lights in the Universe, which is available on August 18th at your library or bookseller. Professor Seeger is the class of 1941 Professor of Planetary Science Professor of Physics and Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Her past research is credited with laying the foundation for the field of exoplanet atmospheres, while her current research focuses on exoplanet atmospheres and the future search for signs of life by way of atmospheric biosignature gases. Before joining MIT in 2007, Professor Seeger spent four years on the senior research staff at the Carnegie Institution of Washington, preceded by three years at the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton. She holds a PhD from Harvard and a BSc from the University of Toronto. Among other accolades, Professor Seeger is a member of the National Academy of Sciences and a 2013 MacArthur Fellow. So thank you so much to Professor Seeger for being here tonight. I do have a couple of Zoom housekeeping notes. Let me just make sure I have them in the right place. One second. Um, so first, we're recording this session for broadcast on Wacam. Uh, they'll also put it on YouTube. So you may see your tiny picture uh, on TV unless you turn off your video screen of your video sharing. Um, also, uh, Professor Seeger has slides for some portions of the program, so you might want to switch to the speaker view so you'll see Professor Seeger next to her slides as opposed to everyone else. It's up to you. I'll also put this info into the Zoom chat. And feel free to add your questions at any time to the Zoom chat, um, and I or Professor Seeger will um, try to bring them up and address them at the right moment. So without further ado, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Professor Seeger. Thank you. 10 years ago, I started my job at MIT. Have any of you seen the, the TV show, The Big Bang Theory? Is anyone a fan of that show? It's such a funny show. That's me, astrophysicist. My job is to search for alien life, not little green humanoids, but signs of life on planets orbiting stars other than the sun. Every star is the sun. And if our sun has planets, Earth, Venus, Mars, etc., it makes sense that other stars have planets also, and they do. And we already know of thousands of planets. And in our galaxy alone, there are billions of stars, making the possibilities out there just incredible. So how many of you have seen a truly dark sky. You can raise your hand, like you can do that, yeah. Well, I w wish the best for you to be able to see that someday. No matter so though, tonight, uh, okay, we're all indoors watching our computers, but it's getting darker earlier and earlier here. Probably by like 9.30, I want you to go outside tonight and look up at the sky and you'll be able to see at least a few stars from Wayland. Like from Concord, we can see a bunch of stars. Concord's where I live. And I want you to look up those stars and you can wonder what kind of planet is around that star. Because we think that all stars have planets, all stars have their own solar systems. When I look at the stars, I actually take that a step further. And I like to think what, I like to wonder if there are intelligent beings on a planet orbiting that other star. And if they're looking back at our sun, which is a star to them, and wondering the same thing, if anyone's out there. So um, my memoir, it's called The Smallest Lights in the Universe. And it is about uh, the journey of inner space and also the journey of outer space. And I'm gonna start about this journey of outer, start with the journey of outer space. Here's a picture, a real picture of a galaxy. It's a collection of gravitationally bound stars. And we think that our own, our sun is part of a galaxy we call the Milky Way galaxy. And we think it looks something like this galaxy. And in our galaxy alone, there are hundreds of billions of stars. And in our universe, we think there are hundreds of billions of galaxies. So if you just think about how many stars are out there, there have to be so many planets. You know, when we think about trying to find planets like Earth and signs of life on those planets, even if it's incredibly rare, our universe has to be just peppered with, with planets that can and do support life. 
So if you're interested in these um, planets around stars other than the sun, we call them exoplanets, I encourage you to download this software. It's called Eyes on Exoplanets. It's by NASA. And this software actually takes us to a real map of the sky. Here, the white points are stars, and the highlighted dots are stars with known planets. So look how many stars have known planets. In this software, you can click on the menu bar for Earth. And the people who made this little movie of the software for me, they are in California. And so they're showing us the night sky in the spring from California. And you can see all the stars with known planets, the highlighted stars, they've overlaid the constellations. And there actually is a very special part of our sky where NASA's Kepler Space Telescope stared for four years. And look how many stars with planets there are, so many. You can fool around with this software. Here, we're putting in Kepler 186, the name of a star with planets. And the software is like taking us to the part of the sky where that star is. And, is letting us see what kind of planets are there. There are five planets. And one of these uh, planets is in the so-called Goldilocks zone, where the planet as heated by the star is not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. Now here's the zoom in of the planet, of a planet. You've got to read that fine print. Can you see it at the bottom of my screen? It says, hypothetical visualization of planet because we don't have images of exoplanets like that. You know, we know about stars with planets. We might know the planet size or mass, and we may know the orbit of the planet, how far the planet is from its star, but we actually don't know very much else about them. Even though we know about thousands of stars with planets, we don't yet have the ability to learn a lot about them. So let me um, speculate for you with the help of these NASA travel posters Imagining if we could go someday, advertise to travel someday to another star system, which by the way, they're so far away that in our lifetimes at least, we have no hope of, of going there in person. This poster says Kepler 186F, where the grass is always redder on the other side. The planet we had looked at, Kepler 186F, it's orbiting a red dwarf star, a star much redder and cooler than our sun. And the artist here is imagining that the uh, planet has red trees instead of green trees. This next poster says, experience the gravity of HD 40307G, a super Earth. And this particular planet has a higher gravity than Earth's, is more massive. And they're imagining you getting to travel there and parachuting just to see what it would be like in a planet that's much different from Earth. Relax on Kepler 16b, the land of two suns where your shadow always has company. Kepler 16b orbits two stars, actually. And it's a pretty interesting one. We know about a dozen planets like that that have two suns. I like to say that science fiction got some things right for any Star Wars fans out there. I wanted to just leave you with um, one more thing at this point about exoplanets, and that's how we find them. We have lots of ways to find planets, but the, most, the main way we discover exoplanets today is by the so-called transit method. You can see, can you see the little planet going in front of the star on the top of the figure? That actually is an artist's conception because we don't um, resolve stars. We don't see the surface of stars like that other than our sun. What you're seeing though is this um, concept that some planets, the orbits are aligned perfectly, just so. So the planet appears to go in front of the star as seen from uh, our telescopes and from Earth. And what we do as astronomers, we measure the brightness of stars, like taking a picture you know, every few seconds or minutes, and we construct a time series. That's why this is showing you at the bottom here, a graph, brightness um, as a function of time. And when the planet goes in front of the star, the starlight drops by a tiny amount. And when the planet finishes transiting the star, then the starlight goes back to normal. And I just stepped down from a leadership role on an MIT-led NASA mission called TESS, where we observe TESS is a, a satellite orbiting Earth, and it looks at one giant strip of the sky for a whole month. You know, in TESS, we find 100 new planet candidates, 100 every month. Like, imagine finding 100 whole new worlds each month. Now, back 25 years ago when I started in exoplanets, we only had five planets outside of our solar system. And so now imagine going from hardly any to just so many, we, we can't even really count them.
So, you know, at that uh, 10 years ago or so when I started at MIT, I like, almost really had the perfect life. I had this great career that was just blooming. I had my dream home. I don't know if anyone in Wayland lives in an old Victorian. It's kind of like a dream home until you actually live in it. <laughs> it's just old and really, uh, really problematic. I had two adorable toddlers. I had a wonderful husband, but my husband, Mike, had a series of nagging stomach aches that just got worse. And the doctors uh, blew him off. Like how many of you, you don't have to put your hand up here, but you know, how many of you have had a problem? You know, and you go to the doctor and they're like, it's nothing, don't worry about that. Like maybe that's our insurance, you know, speaking, don't wanna do anything. They just told him to take Metamucil, which I'm pretty sure a man in his forties doesn't just kind of, you know, yeah. Anyway, they refused to do tests until finally he ended up in the emergency room with a complete intestinal blockage. No food could go down, no food could come out. So he was in the hospital and I was with him and all I could do was uh, think about my dad who had died. Of, okay, the story gets a bit sad, but there's a happy ending, so don't worry. But all I could do was think about my dad who he had a really bad stomachache a few years earlier and he died a few months later. And I was just like, the tears started flowing in the hospital and the doctor just started yelling at me, Sarah, stop crying. And he went on to say, you know, this could be nothing. Like you tell me, how is a complete 100% intestinal blockage? How is that nothing? Like, no, that is not nothing. He said, look, it could resolve on its own without surgery. If he has to have surgery, um, it might not be cancer. If it is cancer, it might be self-contained like a sausage. You just chop out part of your intestine. If it um, has spread, he'll get chemo and on and on. And I want to tell you that it was like a nightmare because every possible option, like at every turn, and I, I'm sure some of you have had this. I hope you haven't, but I'm guessing one person's had like, you know, and the worst possible thing happens every time. Like it, it was, yes, it was blocked. Yes, it was cancer. Yes, it had spread already. No, the chemo didn't work. And with several months later, um, he was declared terminally ill. That's hard to face you know, face your life has like you thought was going to go on indefinitely, all of a sudden just truncated. And one day, Mike came home and told me, uh, Sarah, you know, the doctor said, I shouldn't die at home because we have small children. And I became white hot angry. I was by now like really furious with the doctors in general. I mean, it wasn't their fault that he got sick, but like longer story short, he shouldn't, he should have lived actually. But he had a problem they should have caught a long, long time ago. It's Crohn's disease. So if any of you, you know, if you have Crohn's, you monitor it, you don't get cancer. But if you don't know you have it, you, you can have a much higher incidence of this terrible, terrible cancer. And I was so angry the doctor told him that. I just said, Mike, you know, what kind of lesson would that teach our children? You know, that we dump sick people at the hospital to die? I just said, Mike, we are going to teach our sons that we will take care of you and love you until the day you die. And you know, that day came too soon. And grief is a terrible thing. So I hope you don't have to go through that ever. Um, some people do get to live their whole lives, like never experiencing grief. His, his death was catastrophic in so many ways. I was so lucky by the way, because he worked part time. So he did most things around the house. Like I did heavy childcare, but one thing was he so sweetly, he left me three pages of instructions, like who to call if this goes wrong, who to call if that goes wrong. I hadn't even really thought about like when you, even though I'm an astrophysicist, right? When you, you know, when you have the central vac and you vacuum up all the junk, like where does it go? Like it hadn't occurred to me that it goes somewhere and once in a while you have to deal with that something. Um, so everything was like that. I didn't know what to do. I was like so upset and depressed. You know, the usual face you put on when you go outside and you're nice to people? That, that's not happening. And to make it even harder, uh, ever, later on, I learned that I have Asperger's, which by the way, every time you say something, I have to translate that into my Asperger's language. And then when I wanna say something to you, I have to think carefully about how I'm gonna say it. So that was gone and everybody thought I was so cold and so rude and so horrible. So all this was going on. In the meantime, like I would go to my book club and the other women in this book club, uh, they don't actually read the, the book though. You go to the book club and you just kind of talk and drink wine. But they would complain about things like, well, who's picking up the kids? Well, this, well, that. And like the whole world was just kind of 
blah. Like I, I couldn't fit in the world and it made no sense to me. But actually something at that time, like amazing happened too, because the death of my husband was so meaningful that all the little things like somehow at the time didn't matter anymore like the traffic or the shopping lines or this or that, or you know, all those people complaining, I could just ignore that. And just for a while, everything became so crystal clear, there were no shadows. And I was able to do some of my uh, most, most important work. And when I think about the stars, it gives me the same sense of perspective. I like to imagine that there's an intelligent civilization or on a planet orbiting a nearby star who have the kind of telescopes we're hoping to build and to them, uh, Earth is just a pinprick of light. Pinprick of light. It's a pale blue dot. It's just another exoplanet. It's so, like it's hard to confront my own personal tragedy against the vastness of the universe. But I want you to know, actually, that we do have a picture of Earth as a pale blue dot. This is this picture? This actually is an image taken by the Voyager One spacecraft from four billion miles away. And our Earth is that little pale blue dot. That red line, the red streak there, it's actually scattered light in the camera optics. That's all our Earth looks like from far away, just that pale blue dot. And, you know, to deal with my new sense of meaninglessness, I decided I would pursue the search for another Earth and for signs of life on another planet to show that we're not alone. Now, Earths are incredibly hard to find. All those thousands of planets we know about now, they are nothing like Earth. We have found a Jupiter-sized planet, like a big, huge planet, where an Earth should be. We have found Earths that are so close to the star, their time they take to go around the star is less than one day. And as heated by that star, that sun, their surfaces are so hot, it melts rock, and there are liquid lava lakes, we think. We have found planets that are so low density, we don't understand how they can exist. They could be water worlds, planets that are like honestly mostly water with a uh, high pressure ice deep into the interior. So we haven't found any Earths yet. They're incredibly hard to find. They are so small and so dim compared to the bright star they're sitting beside. These other Earths, they are the smallest lights in the universe. So um, that's actually kind of a flavor of my memoir. Um, it's the search for meaning, it's the exploration of space, it's a description of the birth and the evolution of a new field of science, of exoplanets. Um, and I'm not sure if any of you have read this book called Lab Girl. Lab Girl, it's like this new genre of memoir, and there's sort of this, like surprisingly, a growing number of books like this. They mix science and personal, and they tell a scientist's story. And so my book is in the spirit of that um, same genre. It also, you know, talks about like the way out of rock bottom, how to connect with others, how to find what, what we're looking for. So, you know, science fiction got some things wrong. Um, Star Trek, any fans out there? Star Trek. In Star Trek, the Enterprise had to travel at incredible speeds to go and orbit around another planet so that Spock could use his analyzer and look at the surface and see if it was inha inhabited. But you know, like the movie, the big, like the TV show, The Big Bang Theory and Star Trek and Star Wars, if they made a life about, if they made a movie about me and the other astronomers trying to find planets like Earth with signs of life on them, that would be like the most boring movie ever existed. Our field actually moves at a snail's pace. And most of our work is in front of the computer number crunching. You know, we get data from telescopes, but we have to use our computers pretty much all the time. So we don't go to planets. Uh, we don't, we can't, we, we don't need to. Instead, we actually take data with the Hubble Space Telescope as one of our workhorses for exoplanets. We use large ground-based telescopes. Um, this field is really, really pretty booming. And the way that we study planets, the way we're going to look for life on other planets, um, okay, we're not looking for those little green humanoids. What we're gonna be looking for are gases in the atmosphere of a planet orbiting a distant star. And we're going to be looking for gases that don't belong, that are there in huge quantities, and that might have been um, made by life. So our planet Earth, for example, we have oxygen, fills our atmosphere to 20% by volume. And you know, without life, without plants and photosynthetic bacteria, our Earth would have virtually zero oxygen. 
So those uh, hypothetical intelligent beings, they have to have a telescope way better than Hubble, by the way. But if they're looking at us and they can see Earth and they can see our atmosphere and they see oxygen, they'll be very suspicious. They won't be able to guarantee there's life here, but I think they'd have a pretty good shot at inferring it. So to break that down for you a little more, I want you to think about a rainbow for a moment. I'm pretty sure you've all seen a rainbow. I hope you have. But what you might not know is that if you could look at the rainbow really closely, there would be lines missing. And here's a rainbow. It's our sunlight split up, not by a raindrop, but by a instrument called a spectrograph inside a special telescope. And see here all these lines? Some of them are fat, some are thin. They're all different. But each one of these lines, or there's actually a pattern of lines that correspond to an individual gas. And these lines are atoms and molecules. I like to say they're taking a bite out of the light. They're absorbing gases. And there are people uh, on this planet who know like what each of these lines means. Like one set of, line might be, set of lines might be due to oxygen. One site set might be to gases in the sun's atmosphere, calcium and magnesium and other things. We call this spectroscopy and it's, it's how almost all of astronomy is done. Not almost all, but a large part of traditional astronomy is done by, by spectroscopy. And why we're gonna do spectroscopy is, you know, you may have um, heard Venus be called our sister planet. Well, Earth is so great for life. We have water and continents and air we can breathe. But Venus is about the same size and mass, but it is so hot. The surface of Venus is hot enough to melt lead. Life could never survive on Venus's surface. So our whole goal is to find other planets out there, planets um, that we can look at the atmospheres. And by the way, we can study exoplanet atmospheres today. They're just not rocky planets like Earth. They're hot, giant planets type of planet that won't host life. And we've learned a lot of tremendous things. If you're interested, be sure to ask me in the Q&A and I can tell you a bit more about what we're finding today for giant planets. So my favorite way, in, so by the way, one really exciting thing happened to me in the course of the, the memoir. And that is after my husband died, I had to drop out of a lot of my work. Like I still had my job, I went to work, I got my job done, but the extra things that professors and scientists do. We're almost like entrepreneurs, like I'm making a startup, starting up a new project. I couldn't do any of that actually. But as I started recovering, um, I got a call from NASA asking me if I wanted to lead a study of a brand new type of telescope that was kind of ongoing on how to find another Earth. And this telescope, we call it Starshade. Here's a movie showing you a Starshade folded up and launching. It launches with a telescope with the petals unfurling. And starshade is a very, very special shape. The petals have to be made incredibly precisely. And the whole of starshade is tens of meters in diameter. It would have to formation fly tens of thousands of kilometers from the telescope to block out starlight so we could see planets directly. I'm actually gonna show you that movie again because it went by a little quick. So it's launching together with the telescope in this image. Look at those petals. Each of those petals is, I don't know, six, seven meters long. It unfolds. And that starshade has a spacecraft attached to it with its own fuel. And in this animation, this artist conception, they're showing you the starshade uh, over months actually it would take to fly away and, and block out the starlight. Uh, so we can see planets down to earth like planets directly. This is so hard, honestly, the contrast in brightness between an earth in reflected light and the sun is like 10 billion. It is such a huge number. It's almost um, unfathomable. So I got to lead this incredible starshade study. Here's myself and two team members at NASA JPL. And we're actually showing you a pedal prototype. And this prototype was engineered to demonstrate that we could make the pedal to the specifications needed, which is something like um, 100 microns. So the shape is prescribed like the width of the human hair, and it has to be made to that level. Just as a little technical detail, you might, you're probably not wondering, but you may wonder, how would we even measure that? You can't get out a ruler and measure it to six decimal places. Like that's to actually not to four decimal places. Actually, if you look on this, you might be able to see these bright dots. Can you see these dot, dot, dot? There's these bright dots here. Those are incredibly reflective dots. And this pedal would be put on a table with a laser system on above it. And that laser zips around and precisely measures um, the distances between the points and is able to 
after measuring many, many positions many times, calculate the exact shape of this petal. If you want to know why it has to be a special shape, again, please feel free to ask me in the questions. Here's the Starshade Lab at NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory in California. You can see David here. He is um, showing you a few scale models of the Starshade. There's a petal, uh, their petal. There's a, uh, they call it membrane management. How would you manage the material that holds Starshade, uh, that makes up Starshade? There's some scale models of petals. There's demonstrations of it folding and and unfolding. Well, um, I haven't found another Earth yet, <laughs> but I have found two incredibly amazing things. Okay, so one day, I was um, about five months after my husband had died. I was, uh, you know, it's the, the sort of analogy is that you have no money in the bank. Like you're in your emotional bank, there is nothing. So you're kind of on edge and I had just had, I only had like one friend at that time who understood what I was going through and I had a major fight with falling out with him. And I woke up in the morning, I just had a huge headache, but there was snow on the ground and it was a beautiful January day. And I took my kids to this local sledding hill. It's called Nishatak Hill. Like Concord is a very flat town, except for some reason we have this giant hill. So I took them out to this hill and my kid was having some problems. And I just had, I was having like this major, I hope you've never had this, it's, it's really bad, but I was having a major meltdown in public. And this woman approached me and it turned out she was also a widow and she was about my age and she kind of rescued me from all of this. And she uh, told me that our, in our town Concord, we have about 19,000 people. There were six other widows that same age, all with kids. And they were meeting, they were going to get together a few weeks later on Valentine's day. And so I started becoming friends with these, these other widows. And the widows were absolutely incredible. They, um, they rescued me. So the amazing thing was I got to meet this other group of people in my town. And here we are one Father's Day. I anonymized pretty much everyone. These kids are all grown up now, right? So some of the kids are in college. I'd say a good number of them are in the local high school. And there's me in the center and there's one of my children, Max. I'd say he was not um, eight years old at the time. That's my son, Alex. He was seven at the time. Yeah, all these widows, we got together on the so-called important holidays on Valentine's Day and Father's Day and uh, Halloween. And the first thing uh, the widows, and we also met every other Friday morning for coffee. The first thing we talked about was how to stay afloat financially. Like that was a tough one. I was actually the only one working. So we had to figure a lot out. The second topic was dating. Everyone wanted to, sh not everybody, but those dating wanted to tell like stories. And I'll never forget when Melissa, there's Melissa here. She figures prominently in the book. My best friend, Melissa, my new best friend. She, uh, I'll never forget, she took me aside one day and she just said, Sarah, you know, it's been like nine months since your husband died. It's time to start dating. I was like, no, that's, that's not happening. That's just, that's just not gonna happen. So the second, uh, okay, so Melissa became my best friend and I started to bring her to work events with me. Work events are always awkward. Um, people expect you to have a plus one. And there's Melissa always smiling, always happy. Me having Asperger's being very socially awkward. Her always great with talking to people. So she was a wonderful plus one to bring to all, all of my events. Um, I took her to, eventually, believe it or not, I took her to California to NASA to see the star shade and other things. Here we are. At NASA, uh, we're looking at the, <laughs> this is in California, where they have something they call the Mars Yard. And there's a rover here. They can test out uh, Mars rovers here. And there's one time one of the rovers, rovers had a tear in its tire. And so they could run the tire many, 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 many times and try to find a solution here on Earth and then relay that on how to preserve the tires for a longer time on Mars. Uh, all right, the other part of this picture on the right is Melissa's all dressed up in a bunny suit to go in the clean room to see a special telescope where they don't want dust from your skin and hair getting on the special equipment. So you have to dress up and then you walk through this little room that has like a giant uh, airstream to blow things off of you. Here's Melissa and I pretending to uh, control the Mars rover in the control room. <laughs> and so the second amazing thing that happened to me was I, while I was a keynote speaker at an amateur astronomy conference in Canada where I'm from, I went to this amateur astronomy conference and they have it on a long weekend. It's somewhat frugal. It's kind of a pain for the speaker, obviously, because I left my family behind, left my kids behind with our fam, um, 
an extended family friend who was their babysitter. And I went to this conference and the first thing that happened, the conference was held at a small call, like a small college. So like imagine a room, there's like concrete blocks everywhere about like maybe a hundred people. There's some refreshments and hors d'oeuvres. And what, right when I walked into this room, the most amazing thing happened to me. Across the room, I saw a tall, dark, handsome man. And all I thought, I'm the professional astronomer. This is a group of amateur astronomers. And all I could think of was, you know, I have to meet this man. Who is this person? So meanwhile, uh, Melissa was still um, dating and trying to get me to date and everything was going um, pretty badly. She was pondering all this hard work I was telling her about, how hard it is. Uh, she realized how hard it is to find another Earth. The book goes into that. I didn't do a good enough job explaining to you. It is hard, very hard. And Melissa said, you know, Sarah, this is like the widow's wisdom. <laughs> she said, you know, Sarah, I think it is harder to find true love than it is to find another Earth. Well, remember that tall, dark, handsome man? Um, we got married eventually after so we've been married for about five years. And so now I know I'll find another Earth because I found true love. The man at the conference, Charles and I, um, are together now in Concord. He is a great guy. He adopted my two boys. And so now they have a dad again. And that's the flavor of my book. It's this journey of inner space. It's a journey of outer space, the birth of a new field of science, exoplanets. And I hope you enjoyed my talk. And I'd like to end with this astronomer's blessing. I wish you clear skies. And I hope that each of you can also find what you're looking for. Thank you so much. There's a few questions in the chat. If you want to take a look, there's a lot of questions from Derek. Right. Well, Victorian homes are the best. I'll just <laughs> say something funny about my house. So I fell in love with my house when I first saw it. Uh, it turned out the woman who owned the house before me was also a single mom for a long time. And she had done very little to the house. So when I first moved in this house, I want to say it was 2007-ish. Like it had no insulation in the walls. None. Zero. It had the, all the original windows. And so like you could just feel like the air, the cold air coming in. And it needed a lot of work. So yeah, that's kind of why I said that, but it's definitely a charming house um, for thing. Okay, so Lab Girl was a great book. I'm glad you liked it. The one thing that my book is a little different was in Lab Girl, she artfully, the author artfully alternates chapters. Like there's a chapter of the seedling coming out and then there's a chapter of her being born and mine it interweaves it together. From Derek, way too many questions. He met me during the 150th, thank you so much. Um, what do I think the impact of identifying life elsewhere will have here on earth? Okay, so I wish I could say it would have like a major earth shattering impact and it would change our lives as we know it. But you know, it's most likely finding life elsewhere will be a very slow and gradual process. Like we will find, I believe that in, I'm doing the best I can to make sure we find some signs of life on another planet. So that oxygen analogy, we may find signs of oxygen somewhere, but it may not be enough for us to be sure or confident even that it's caused by life. You know, we'll need a next generation telescope. So I don't think it will be like one thing that happens so suddenly, like there's a hundred percent definitive case, there's life elsewhere and whatever. I think it'll give everyone time to adapt, especially for some religions that will struggle with having life elsewhere. I think we'll all adapt pretty slowly. So I don't think it will have a huge impact, not right away. Event. So what are my expectations for the Perseverance rover? Actually, it's pretty great. I hope all of you got to watch the launch. It's exciting. Another mission to Mars. I personally, um, I mean, the expectations are that it will, it wants to find some ancient signs of life. I don't know enough ab about it to really speak more authoritatively than that, but I think it'll always find great things. How would I pr pr prioritize the search for life versus the search for habitable planets? Okay, so what uh, Derek is referring to is like, we have a finite budget, like all of us do individually, but there's so many great things in planetary science. I talked about exoplanets, planets orbiting stars other than our sun and you know, a chance to find life there, but we could have life in our own solar system. Like people think there may be ancient, like uh, fossilized life on Mars or even current. We, one of um, Saturn's moons, Titans, Titan, 
has liquid lakes. We think liquid is needed for life to survive. It has liquid hydrocarbon lakes of all things. We think maybe life there. Some of us even think there could be life in Venus's atmosphere. It has a layer in the atmosphere that is the right temperature for life. And like our own Earth has an aerial biosphere of bacteria, Venus may have life just living in the clouds. So what are my, I, the priority is a tough one. You know, I, I think it's going to take us a long time to get everything done because there's so many great things to do. So I would have to prioritize habitable planets because that's my main field of research. <laughs> okay, once we've identified, I actually have a more technical talk that would be more suitable for Derek. Uh, what measurements will we need to take about those? Um, okay, so this is a tough one because no matter how great our data, like we want to get data of the planet. Well, I'll just answer this. So what measurements do we want? So we want to find a planet that we think is a rocky planet with a surface like we know it. And that's, we'd like to be able to look at the atmosphere and assess the kind of greenhouse gas content so we can make a good estimate of the surface temperature to know that it's not too hot, not too cold, but just right for life. Those are the basic measurements we, we'd like to take initially. Okay, now we have um, a question about the James Webb Space Telescope. So I flashed up a picture of Hubble and we have a new telescope that is supposed to launch in the year 2021, that's sometime towards the end of next year. And it used to be called the Next Generation Space Telescope, NGST. It's actually now called the James Webb Space Telescope because it's like a, a new Hubble, but it really is quite different. It's bigger than Hubble, it works in the infrared, Instead of orbiting Earth, the James Webb Space Telescope will be like a trillion miles away in a much colder, darker environment that's better for astronomy. So the James Webb uh, will make it easier to study Earth-sized planet. It's not gonna discover planets, but in terms of what Hubble can do now, like what Hubble is for giant planets, the James Webb Space Telescope will be for small rocky planets. And there's hundreds, there are literally like 300 exoplanet astronomers wanting to use the James Webb Telescope to study small rocky planet atmospheres and to look for signs of life. Okay, from Jim, will we find alien life on an exoplanet or within our solar system? Okay, I'm gonna have to go for exoplanet on that one. And the reason is just numbers. You know, in our solar system, we could have life on Venus, Mars, or Titan. We also have some of other moons of Jupiter and Saturn, you know, including Europa and Enceladus, but Back to the question about money, like we probably only have chance to visit two of those things. So that's two versus exoplanets, we have dozens. So I'm gonna go with the numbers that there's more exoplanets we can access and that's our likely chance. What are the most interesting planets that I found? What was interesting about them? I'll speak for the community in general, but I think the most interesting planets are the following. So it turns out the most common type of planet out there, it's not a Jupiter. And we always expected that planets grow until they stop growing. Like that a planet forms and like a cosmic vacuum cleaner, it sucks in all the gas around it. And that it would keep growing in a runaway phase until it's big like Jupiter. But we've found through the Kepler Space Telescope primarily that Jupiters are not that common actually. And that the most common type of planet out there is a planet that's two to three times the size of Earth. And we have nothing like that in our own solar system. We have Uranus and Neptune that are four times the size of Earth. We don't know how they formed. <laughs> we have Jupiter and we have Earth and Venus that are same size. Yeah, so how did these mysterious planets form? We call them, we're not as creative, but we call them mini Neptunes. So for the mini Neptunes, yeah, we, we don't know how they formed. So that's probably my favorite planet just because we don't know anything about them. Okay, here's a really good question, Andrew Jennings. 60 years ago, he visited an observatory on Nantucket that specialized in variable stars. How do we distinguish between variable stars and stars whose various brightness because of planets? Aha, good one. You would not believe how many variable stars are out there. With TESS, we look at 20,000 stars in detail every month and maybe about a million stars that are less in less detail. And there's just so many more variable stars than planets, they're unbelievable. How we distinguish it is that the planet has that very special drop in brightness. Remember the little movie I showed you? It's like a box shape. It's really specific. It's a very characteristic shape. And the variable stars have their own characteristic shapes that are usually um, totally, totally different uh, from the transiting planets. 
Now that said, there are definitely a bunch of false positives. And the way that we distinguish planets from other things is a, lar a lot of work. Once tests or other surveys find a planet candidate, it goes out to the community of ground-based observers and they use lots of telescopes in lots of different ways to make sure that there's not a contaminating star or two stars eclipsing each other. Question from Courtney. Okay, I talked about this hyper-focused state of grief. It was so great, even though I was so depressed. Like you can see clearly about what really matters. And later on, my best friend, Melissa, she had a way to describe it. It's the stuff everyone's doing, you know, like you're going shot, like you go grocery shopping, oh, you forgot something, you go grocery shopping again, you make small talk. That's stuff you don't want to do. And she called that ant noise. With all due respect to the ants, they seem to just be wandering around doing stuff and not really doing much. Ant noise. The world was ant noise. Has that lasted? Okay, so the bad news is it hasn't lasted. Like I'm happy again and I went to, the, my husband was away. I went to the grocery store like every day. I'd be like, yeah, I may as well go. Forgot this, I should get that. Even with the masks and all the trouble. But the good news is that since I experienced that state, I can sometimes get back to it. I literally sometimes can. It takes more effort to remind myself what really matters and just how to stay focused. Thank you. I had another question about, um, before you started talking about the widows, um, you said, um, oh gosh, now I forget. It was something about being alone in the universe. And I was wondering how, um, so it sounds like you found community through the widows. I was wondering about your work and uh, finding community there. Yes, I actually, I did find community at work. So I'm not sure if Derek, if you were from MIT. So the funny thing about MIT is people, like oftentimes undergrads will go to MIT and they will say it's like the first time they've read friends. <laughs> and you can laugh if you want, like most, I'd say like a good half of people at MIT are somewhere on the Asperger spectrum. So we go there and we just feel good. But I actually did have this wonderful thing happen to me during like kind of just before and during the grief stage where I had um, some wonderful students and postdocs who became like family to me. Like it's not their job to be my family, but one of them went hiking with my younger son and I. And for some of these students, like we would go to a conference, like I didn't have childcare. Like I couldn't, I didn't have like, I don't have family really or not family that could take care of my kids or enough friends. And so they wanted to go to conference. I literally brought them. I would take them out of school. This was insanely expensive. <laughs> I'd bring the babysitter. And then the students would also go to the conference and then I would invite them on a vacation after. <laughs> And nice. so I ended up like vacationing and getting really close with like the subset of my students and postdocs. One time we went to New Mexico to test this telescope we were building in the dark skies. And we just had like a great time um, after that. So yeah, I did actually find a really wonderful sense of community. And those same people uh, remain really close to me today. And this may be too personal, so feel free to say pass, but um, I'm wondering about your kids and uh, if they share sort of your perspective on science and the model and oh, right. yeah, yeah. Like, okay, I thought you were going to ask something else, but to science and what was the other part? So um, you seem to get a lot of perspective on your own grief from your work. Have you passed it on to your kids or do they benefit from that? Like, so kids are resilient, very resilient. And we have to face that parents died like, oh, not so much today, right? But in past centuries, millennia, parents probably just died all the time. They're incredibly resilient. And it is very personal, but kids, they don't really remember, you know, like mm. I think they're designed to recover. And part of that recovery is not remembering. Mm. So they would always like, they didn't understand why I was still so sad after mm. like a year or two. And one would be like, you know, your heart is like a broken bone. <laughs> they say stuff like that to me. Or, you know, a grief trigger would come by, like something that I used to love to do with my first husband, and they just couldn't really, they didn't have that same perspective at all. Um, I actually told them about the book. I'm like, don't read the book till you're 21. Because really? there's a book, and it's really upset. Like, parts of the book are really upsetting. And my one son's like, well, how can other people read it? And we're not allowed to read about ourselves. I'm like, it's very different. If it's about someone else, people don't get as upset. They don't have that perspective at all, but they do know a lot about science. They are very spoiled. They have seen total solar eclipse. They have seen multiple rocket launches, four. They've forgotten the first three. 
<laughs> um, and they have gotten to see like the dark night sky, the Milky Way, the Perseid meteor shower. And so they have a lot of stuff they just know by, let's call it osmosis. And they're also, if I may say, you know, they're good at science too, so they retain and absorb. And they don't really, like kids live in their own little world, as you know. And so they don't really realize, um, like sometimes we go, once I remember, um, I have this very good friend who's a black hole astrophysicist. Like, so kids, you know, do you have anything to ask Samaya? She can, she can answer anything about black holes. But they're just sort of have, so it's a kind of different upbringing in that way. And so they do have not a perspective um, on grief, but they certainly know a lot of science. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Does anyone else have any more questions? Feel free to unmute also, if you'd just rather speak them aloud. Last chance. <laughs> hey, Sarah, this, this is Derek. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to actually be unmuted before, but uh, yeah, this has been a, a, a fantastic talk. I mean, I, uh, I, I think I met you as a, back, back, back at the MIT 150 uh, activities, and uh, I've, I, I sort of somehow lost touch with where you were and, and what had happened, um, but I've definitely followed uh, what uh, your, some of your students have been doing since then, and they've gone on and, and, and done some tremendous stuff. Um, but so I am actually really interested in looking forward to uh, uh, reading the book, and I will definitely do that. And uh, just just thank you. I, mean, I just wanted to send my appreciation. So thank you so thanks. much. Thank you. Well, it sounds like um, no more questions. And it also sounds like we should ask Sarah back to give an exoplanet talk when she has a free moment. But thank you so much for your talk and for your book. We're all excited to read it. And I hope everyone stays well and has a great night. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.